Hey, Bubbles. I don't think I've ever come on stage to Bubbles before. That's great. Thank you so much for having me at your fantastic conference. I am used to going to conferences where the audience is mainly men in blazers and chinos. That's my average tech conference. So this is absolutely fantastic and inspiring and vibrant. So thank you for inviting uh, what is, frankly, a dot-com dinosaur. Because I have worked in internet technologies for <coughs> 25 years, and I feel as though I am a dinosaur in this industry, even though I'm actually only 45. I want to tell you a little bit about my own personal journey through technology, but much more importantly, why I think this is the moment that we must embed responsibility and make responsibility the new normal in how we build products and services. And I know that we'll find a huge number of people in this audience who are probably already doing that, and a lot of kindred spirits in this amazing space. So I hope that you'll join us at Dot Everyone and our movement to make responsibility the new normal. Now, when I started my career in technology, we were looking at the information superhighway. Remember that? It was a long time ago, and it was going to whiz around the world, and everybody was going to be zooming up and along it. And my first job was in uh, a consulting company, and I was sent around the world to benchmark how different, company, how different countries were doing along this information superhighway. It was an amazing start in the world of technology. And somewhat dispiritingly, for somebody who has always lived in the UK, when I was sent in 1994 to South Korea, they would, had a faster network than we currently have now in the UK. It's not very good, is it? I then was lucky enough to start a business, lastminute.com, back when the internet was just emerging as something that people would use to buy products and services. When we started in 1997, no one believed that lastminute.com was going to be a success. That was absolutely not in question. What we were trying to convince people was that the internet was actually going to survive, was not going to blow up, that people were going to put their credit card details into the internet. That was the normal then. That was the normal that we were trying to make part of people's everyday lives. We had spent thousands of meetings talking to venture capitalists who did not give us money, trying to convince them that the travel sector was going to change and that people really were going to buy products and services through a website. Every single one said no. Nobody wanted to give us any money. Nobody believed that the normal was going to be buying products and services on a website. Luckily, one, one company said yes, they'd give us some money, and we were able to start our business. And I think about this a lot, and I mention it today, not because I'm stuck in the late 90s, although my clothes might think I am, but mainly because it felt like such a different time. A young woman could start a business, we could convince the world that industries were going to change, we could offer something shiny and new for customers, we could build products and services that people could not possibly use in the real world. They were only enabled by the internet. And it felt like such an exciting time. But we didn't think about social responsibility, we weren't designing for safety. We weren't worrying about data. There was no Facebook. There was no Google. Certainly no Snap, no Twitter, none of the other platforms that we all know so well. We were just trying to build the best products and services for customers. And that was what that vanguard of the internet felt like back in the late 90s. People talk a lot now about the unintended consequences of the design of technology. Well, I think the biggest unintended consequence that we had in the design of our website was when a customer came on the phone and shouted at my head of customer service agent, Justin, shouted for probably about 10 minutes. And Justin came up to my desk and said, you've got to deal with this customer. They are absolutely apoplectic about something. Finally, I managed to calm the customer down and worked out why they were so angry was because of the fast buy function on the website. Now, this was particularly unhappy-making for me because we'd spent a lot of time copying Amazon's fast buy function. Press one button, all the populated details were the same as the last time you bought something on the website. Bingo, it was easy peasy. You get the tickets to the same address. You didn't have to keep entering lots of different information. We thought this was brilliant. 
But the law of unintended consequences meant that for this person, it wasn't so brilliant. Because the first time they'd used the website, they'd been taking their wife on holiday. The second time they were using their website, they were not taking their wife on holiday, and yet she had been sent the tickets. Now, I tell that in jest. It was a pretty bad moment. But actually, the unintended consequences of what we're designing now have become a lot more serious. What's normal now? If we were trying to make normal just buying things online back in the late 90s, normal now is a lot more complicated. Normal now seems to be that you have to be the product in the services. Normal now is that hundreds of different devices in your home might talk to each other or might talk back to big companies. Normal now is quite a deep level of anxiety that people feel about the role technology is playing in their lives. We at Dot Everyone in the UK have done some research recently looking at people's attitudes to technology. And this new normal is borne out in some of the research numbers. 53% of people say that they could not get through a single day without using technology and that it has benefited them at an individual level. Perhaps unsurprising. Only 12% of people think that it has benefited society. Only 12% of people believe that technology has benefited society. Now that is very uh, confusing and quite dispiriting for someone like me and many of the people here I know at this conference who believe that technology has such an immense capacity to improve things, to progress and to make social problems better. But clearly, normal now is a complicated picture. People feel very confused about data. Despite all of the kind of Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandals, most people still think data is just something that comes onto their mobile phone. Explaining that actually data is a whole bunch of complex things about how you look around the web and track people is hugely uh, difficult and very uh, nuanced for people to understand. I'm just going to share some of, some of the more detail of the numbers. I'm going to get them out because I always get them wrong and I'll get in trouble from my team. Um, so we've done quite a lot of detailed research about what people feel most anxious about. What is it that is making only 12% of people say that uh, technology is good for societies, society? And we've identified these five main areas where people are feeling quite nervous. The first is how our adverts are targeted. Less than half of people really understand how adverts target them and why they're chased around the web. 83% of people are unaware that information can be collected about them. 83% of people. And certainly that information can be collected about people that they know. One of the numbers that I also find very interesting is that 47% of people don't appreciate and understand that prices may vary on the internet, that I might search for a product and get one price, and somebody else might search for a product and get a completely different price. So the opaque nature of pricing is very difficult for people to unpick, understandably. So we've got complexity about advertising, complexity about personal information, complexity about how pricing exists on the internet and what that transaction is. There's clearly a big issue around news. 62% of people don't realize that social networks can manipulate the news they see, as in the, the order and where it comes from and so on. 62% of people. And 25% of people don't know at all how tech companies make money. Now, there's quite a hodgepodge of different things in all that information. If we just go back to what those blind spots are, data, advertising, where people make money, how products and services are sold, and what that relationship between you and your news is. Those are big, complex areas. Is that the new normal? Do we want it to be the new normal? I would argue, and everyone, the charity that's set up in the UK, would argue we absolutely do not. And this is the moment when we need to try and make responsibility the new normal. We need to build that into the products and services that we are creating in the future. We believe that responsible tech can produce products that people love to use, the simplicity and the ease, but that they're also products that are easier to understand than we currently are able to do. We've done a lot of work in the UK about what does this mean? What is digital understanding? 
I worked for the UK government for a long time on the issue of the digital divide, the people that had never had access to technology. And I'm sure, like most countries in the world, in the UK, it's pretty familiar. It's poor communities and rural communities that have very little access to the internet, both for infrastructure reasons and for financial reasons. And I did a lot of work about how to help build basic digital skills for people. But actually, that's easy, because you can check off on a list. Can you send an email? Tick. Can you stay safe online? Tick. Do you know how to put your credit card details in? Tick. Digital understanding is something much more nuanced and complicated. But I would argue this is what we need to quickly try and raise the bar across all aspects of society so that people feel curious about the technology that they're using, that they can ask questions of it, and that they have a deeper level of trust and empowerment through using it. And this, I think, has to happen at a systems level, it has to happen at an individ as individuals, it has to happen in governments, and it certainly has to happen in the corporate technology sector itself. So I believe that if we can encourage all these bits of society to become more curious and questioning of technology, to understand some of those blind spots that I highlighted from the research, and crucially, to make sure then that they're asking questions and feeling more in control of the services and products they're using, then we can begin to start building more responsible technology into our lives. I sit in the UK Parliament, in the funny second chamber of our Parliament called the House of Lords. And it's not well known for being the most digitally savvy place on the planet, because the average person is 69 years old, and to be honest, when they see me, the main questions that I get asked are about why the Wi-Fi isn't working. But what I've seen from being in the Parliament is the level of uh, dislocation between all aspects of public policy discussion and technology discussion. And even though the House of Lords is a somewhat extreme example of this, I think it's a microcosm for something that's happening all over the world. The pace of change in our daily lives and the products and services that we can have on our smartphone feel far away from the decisions that public sector leaders are making about our lives whether it's budget decisions or how to create new pub products and services, how to deliver a service as a government or as a health leader or as a teacher. And to my mind, this is one of the most urgent things we have to join up. Part of responsible technology is enabling people who are making the biggest decisions about the society that we are building to have a better understanding of what that technology can do. I think that if you're running a school or your hospital, or if you're running the mayor's office in London, you should be able to have a curiosity and a resilience about technology that allows you to think about good digital solutions to the problems that we face. And this is hard and complicated, but really important. So government is one enormous piece of the system change that we need to create. But another important piece is clearly the sector itself, the technology sector itself, the commercial sector, the commercial internet. Now, people here I know have real expertise in different models for um, how organizations can be built and how non-commercial organizations can function. But I think we need to create a big movement around how to embed responsible design at the heart of the commercial internet because otherwise, we're going to continue to live with the unintended consequences. And the good news is, I think this is starting. I think it's starting both at the giant corporate level, but also at the more local level. And again, at Dot Everyone in the UK, we're working with a cohort of organizations who are thinking about what does responsible technology mean when you're actually building a new product and a new service? What are the kinds of design issues that you need to address? What does it mean for privacy? What does it mean for children's services? If you think about the fair trade movement, not everybody buys a fair trade banana or a cotton fair trade t-shirt, but that movement put so much pressure on the mainstream retail market that it moved and arguably has become more and more supplier conscious, ethical, not completely clear, but much better than it was 10, 15 years ago. I think we need the same within the technology sector. 
So in the systems, in the systems change piece, thank you, we have government, we need to build up a closer relationship between governments and policymakers and the technology world so that responsible technology is not just about regulating the internet, which is inevitable and will happen, I believe, but is also about using technology to create good social change. We need to encourage the sector, both small and large, to embed responsible design thinking at the start of these design processes. And we as individuals, I think, need to become that bit more curious, that bit more interested in how our products and services are supplied and make more active choices about how we lead our digital lives. Because actually, we have a lot more choice than we might think. I'm an enormous optimist. I feel so lucky to have worked in this sector for so long. I don't think this is desperate. I think this is actually a problem that we'll look back on and we'll think, oh, that was a funny period of time in the development of technology. What a lot of things we did really badly. How badly we treated each other on the internet. How terrible it was about the data. But actually, I think we can sort this out if we just start asking the right questions. So governments, corporates, us as individuals, if we come together and create that system change, then I think we really can move the dial. In our small way at everyone in the UK, we want to have those conversations and start to build that movement. But the thing that I really go back to in my mind, if I'm feeling as though this is too hard a battle and it's not really worth it, are two stories that I'd just like to end with, which come at this from completely different angles. The first was a young person that I met when I was doing the work uh, helping people get digital skills all over the UK, and it wasn't glamorous work, and it was going to places that most tech entrepreneurs probably never visit. And I met a young man in a very, very rainy uh, city in the north of England called Leeds, and he told me that the internet has saved his life. And I thought, oh, I'm sure that can't quite be true. And then he told me how he'd been found in a bus stop, completely smacked out of his head, homeless, terrible drug problem. He'd been taken to a shelter, and they'd said to him, go to this place and learn about the internet. And he had, when he got a bit better, got a bit stronger, he'd gone to a center to learn a bit about the internet. And he wasn't just learning basic digital skills. He wasn't just one of the numbers that I could knock off in my digital divide quest. This was a person that had taken control of the internet to use in his own life. He was making music online. He was DJing. He had small amounts of money now. I have to tell you, when he played me this music, I was completely, I felt like I was 200 years old. But he was happy, and he felt as though this technology had saved him from a terrible route. It's worth fighting for a fairer internet, it's worth fighting for responsible technology if more people like that young man in Leeds can take control of it and help it shape their lives as opposed to the other way around. So he's my first story. But my second story is a woman that everyone met in the research that we did that I've been sharing with you, who said to us that she had been punched in the face by an Uber driver, and yet she uses Uber every week. She had been punched in the face by an Uber driver, and yet she uses Uber every week. Now, she's not stupid. She clearly had had a very bad experience, but it's just so damn cheap and fast, she continued to use Uber. And that, to me, is pretty much the best metaphor for where we're at in the Internet's development right now. We are all kind of being punched in the face by it, but we use it all the time. And we need to change that conversation. So please, Come meet my colleagues, Stav and Sam, who are here doing a workshop tomorrow with some Dot Everyone work. We'd love to hear your views. We want to build a movement. I believe Europe is so well-placed to do this. We're never going to have the Chinese internet. We don't want to be the west coast of America. Let's be the responsible tech of the world and start to make responsibility the new normal. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very good at timing. I think I've got about five minutes. <laughs> no problem. Martha Lane Fox, thank you very much. Uh, we have time, five, six, seven minutes for questions. So please, if you have any questions, or comments, raise your hand. Advice, views, anything. Anything. Oh, yeah. 
All right, I'm not even going to ask a question. I'm just going to thank you from the bottom of my heart <laughs> for you. basically after this is a three day conference for the last one and a half days, I've been hearing apocalyptic descriptions oh. about how we're all going to hell in a handbasket. And we're you've not. just changed all of that. Oh, thank you. thank you. Well, I don't believe we're going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> As I, take, I take my cue from Barack Obama quite a lot without trying to sound like arrogant. I've not really met him, but he often says, we're not actually, it's not the end of the world until it's the end of the world. I don't believe it's the end of the world. We can, make, we can save the future. There's some ladies. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Not that fast. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julia. Sorry, I can't uh, quite hear you. Sorry. Um, my name is Julia. Hi. I uh, work in business ethics. So thank you very much for what you're saying well, there. You're an expert. Um, yes, we would need to start that urgently. Um, how do you plan to do this? Tell us a bit more um, how you what you've done so yes. far, how can we join yes. you, how can we support yes. you, what can we do, please. Um, thank you, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I have these two brilliant women here. Stab and Sam, where are you? Will you stand up? Where are you? I can't see you. They're here. <laughs> they're there, and they're running a workshop tomorrow where we're going to detail all the work that everyone is doing, so I'd love to tell you more about it. But broadly, we're working on digital leadership, so what does it mean to show good leadership in this area and to understand technology and to act responsibly? And that's both with a cohort of organizations that are outside the public sector and some leaders in the public sector. We're doing our attitudes research so that we really understand what this means, and we're sharing that widely and making sure that we can track what's happening. And we're working on... Um, some prototypes of products that are responsible so that we can show what we mean by good practice. But they'd love to tell you more, and I'm not going to steal their thunder. They do the hard work. I just do the noise. Uh, we have another question way down there. Could you please stand up? Thank you. Hi there. I can't thanks. see. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, also, um, very much agree uh, with your message. Um, I have a... Yeah, I think a question that might be a little hard to answer, but um, I wonder if you can put out something like a definition of what you actually mean by responsible yeah, well, technology. You mentioned enough. this something along the lines of um, allowing for understanding on the user side, which to me sounds um, quite interesting, but yep. I mean, I've heard this a lot around over the last days, and I really wonder yes. what does it actually mean yes. to be responsible? A, a really important question, and I would hate to say that this is the definitive thing, right? But we've been teasing this out, and I, some of the things that um, Dot Everyone has been working on are responsible technologies. Can, this is, I'm just quoting exactly because I know they want me to be exact. Considers the societal impact it creates and seeks to understand and minimize its potential unintended consequences. And that means more specifically, not knowingly uh, deepening existing inequalities, recognizing and respecting the inherent dignity and rights of all, and giving people confidence and trust in how they're used. You know, so that, they're quite big principles, but then you could imagine quite quickly being able to take them and pin them into, okay, so what does that mean in terms of respect of your data or how you communicate terms and conditions or how you uh, are obvious about what the pricing algorithm is. So those are our kind of broad principles. You can find them on our .everyone.org.uk website. Um, but as I say, we're just beginning to really try and flesh out the specificity behind each of those principles. Another question here from the first row. Here we go. Hello, my, my name is Axel. Hi. Um, I, I, I totally agree with you uh, that responsibility is at the core of what we need at the moment. But my, possibly I'm asking the total wrong question at that moment. But what is the business model uh, behind um, Dot Everyone? I would like to oh, There's no business it. model, we're a charity. Ah, okay. We're a charity, we're a charity. We're, we're a charity and we want to make a lot of noise and create the movement. But you know, I would argue that if you not, this isn't about a profit or a not-for-profit. Every business needs to have this at its core. You know, it should be a good business to be a good business. You know, that's what's happened in other sectors, and I think that is what needs to happen now quickly in tech. And we're moving on over here. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. I am an aspiring politician and elected to local council. You mentioned Brilliant. having more digital understanding within yes. government. How will we make how will make that happen? 
Yes, well, this is a huge uh, challenge. I think it's um, going to be a whole selection of different things. I think more people who look and sound like you in politics is a good start. That's what I very firmly believe. Um, we need to build the capacity in the next generation of leaders because it's fundamental. But you know, we've done some work specifically in Dot Everyone. We did a mentoring program with MPs, so we matched them not just with a young person, that's too obvious, but with somebody that could understand what they didn't understand and help them understand it. And I've got quite a lot of hope that we can do that on a bigger scale across different organizations. But actually what we found is that people don't People aren't actively not trying to understand this. It's just really hard. You know, I've worked in this sector my whole life, and I'm freaking confused all the time. So anybody that tells you they know the answers is obviously completely wrong most of the time. So I think it's sometimes just about building the networks and support systems so that public sector leaders know where to go, can talk about the issues, just feel like they have that safe space to ask the questions. And that doesn't feel like such a difficult goal. So I think it's two or three things, but those would be my two. I think we have time for two more questions. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Hi, I'm Wolfgang. I'm working in communications and marketing. And what what I loved, um, um, uh, I loved this analogy to the fair trade movement. Yes, thanks. And part of it is kind of labeling and marketing the idea yes, of yes. fair trade. Is this part of your idea? It might be. Um, again, uh, Stav and Sam can tell you more if you're interested. We originally, when I thought about it, I thought maybe that was the answer. But actually, it's quite hard. It's quite intensive. Do we need another mark? I'm not sure. It might just be that you can coalesce around a set of values, and that's kicks, that starts things off. So it might be. It might not be. It might be over time. It might not be how we start, I think. Um, I believe that you can just get going with a whole group of organizations that sign up to a bunch of principles, and that's maybe the way we get going. And over time, if it morphs into something more concrete or a product, then so be it. And one more question. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm Albert. Uh, I'm, I've wondered a little bit about the uh, numbers you arrived at uh, with your research yes. that you referred to. What was your basic population? Because I couldn't really kind I of think believe it was, we numbers. had, was it 5,000 we did? It was a, it's a deep study, so you can see it again on everyone.org. I think it was 5,000 cohort of people we did face-to-face -face and phone and online, I think it was. But it's a, it's a real study. It was help with, we, help, we were helped by the BBC and another research partner. Uh, and as far as we know, certainly in the UK, it's the first deep uh, look, granular look at attitudes. No problem. So, thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you very much, Martha Lane Fox. Thank you.